Our subject this morning is the Bethlehem of the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering if you are planning on going to Palestine this Christmas in order to make a trek to Bethlehem. Surely all of you will want to see the shepherds when they come down from the hills and the wise men when they arrive from the east. And most assuredly, you will want to both hear and see the angels when they make the announcement. And best of all, you will want to be at Bethlehem at Christmas time in order to see a little baby that's going to be born back of an inn in a stable by the name of Jesus. Perhaps you're saying to yourself right now, well, where's that preacher been for the past 1963 years? What has happened to him? Has he been enjoying a Rip Van Winkle sleep? Does he not know that Jesus was born in 5 B.C. and that the events that surrounded his birth at that time are never to be duplicated, they will never be repeated. His birth, oh, how wonderful it was. But that is a one-time event in the history of the world, and you could never again go through that particular period. There's not even going to be any similarity of circumstances there this Christmas. Oh, we celebrate his birth, and the church will put on a play, act out the events in a pageant or a cantata, and many copies will be made, but there was only one original. One time in the history of this world he was born, and that was 1963 years ago. There may be a reenactment of the event, but there can never be a repetition of what took place at Bethlehem. It's a one-time event. I'm sure this morning that everyone agrees with us at that particular point. But nevertheless, there are some sincere folk today who are trying to produce another Pentecost. They're trying to have a duplicate of the events that took place on the day of Pentecost. And wonderful though they were, they feel that it'd be a glorious experience if we could just go through them again. They not only believe that those events can be repeated one time, but they can be repeated again and again. Here in Southern California this summer, the Pentecostal churches concluded a celebration of the experience, whatever it was, that took place 50 years ago on Azusa Street. And they gave it this title, When the Fire Fell. But no fire fell this year. They didn't even have a repetition of Azusa Street. And the only fire now is the fire that's back of Monrovia in the hills. You can, my friend, no more repeat the events of Pentecost than you can repeat the events that took place at Bethlehem when Jesus was born. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The third person of the Godhead became incarnate. Just as truly as the second person of the Godhead had come to Bethlehem 20 centuries ago. Thus, my friend, today, that thing which took place back yonder on the day of Pentecost is something that cannot be repeated and run as you would run a mimeograph and do it over and over and over again. For those events that took place on the day of Pentecost are just as tangible, just as actual, just as real 
just as definite as Christ coming to Bethlehem. Pentecost is as much a fact as Christmas is. And for the church, it really has more meaning. Our Lord never asked us to remember his birthday. But the day of Pentecost is something that most of the churches have left out. Only liturgical churches today call attention to Pentecost. And yet Pentecost is the birthday of the church. It's the Bethlehem of the Holy Spirit as when he came into the world. And it has more meaning for the church today than any event that has ever taken place since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this morning, we're turning to the second chapter of the book of Acts. We'd like to speak first of all of the objective facts of the day of Pentecost. Then we'd like to speak of the subjective significance of the day of Pentecost. And first of all, will you note with me very briefly the objective facts of the day of Pentecost? They're very familiar to most of us. We've gone over this, we have rehashed these events again and again. And this morning, I just want to skim the cream off of the top here, but there are certain things I want us to note. Now, will you notice verse 1? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the day of Pentecost was one of the seven feast days that God gave to the nation Israel. And it's one of the more important feast days because the Lord picked out three of them he picked out Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, and he said on these three days or these three occasions, I want all the males in Israel to come to Jerusalem to worship. And that's the reason that at this particular time that you find in Jerusalem men out of every nation. They had come from everywhere according to the Mosaic law to celebrate Feast of Pentecost. Now, all of these feasts that God gave form a calendar, which have a very wonderful meaning for us today. I want to turn back to the institution of the day of Pentecost, the 23rd chapter of the book of Leviticus, and read at the 15th verse, and will you listen very carefully? And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. After the offering of the Feast of first fruits, they would account seven Sabbaths and then go to the next day, the fiftieth day, and this feast was called by the Jews and still called by them the Feast of Weeks. We call it the Feast of Pentecost because that is the Greek and Latin word for the weeks here, the fact of the 50th. The 50th day after the seven weeks have gone by. Now will you notice, even under the Mara, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year and one young bullock and two rams, and so on. Now, this is the institution of the Feast of Pentecost, one of the three important feasts that God gave to the children of Israel. Now, the very interesting thing is that it took place on Sunday. I do not have time this morning to go into all of the technical aspects 
of this, but this is without doubt one of the most remarkable of the days they would observe. This one was to be observed on the day after the Sabbath, which is after Saturday, which would be Sunday. My friend, the church was born on Sunday, and if for no other reason, that's the reason the church should observe Sunday. Now will you notice verse 21 here? Ye shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a stature forever in all your dwellings, and so on. So that Sunday, the first day of the week, was to be to them a day in which they rested. Then there's something else that makes this a very remarkable feast. I many times have made this statement from this pulpit. I've only been challenged two or three times. I should have been challenged more. I make the statement that in no feast in the Old Testament or no sacrifice in the Old Testament was leaven permitted. And I always like for somebody to come up and say, well, wait a minute, how about the Feast of Pentecost? On that day it says, they shall be bacon with leaven. How do you explain that? This is the one and only feast in which there's leaven. The Feast of first fruits, none. No leaven. In fact, it was strictly forbidden. For that feast speaks of the death and resurrection of Christ. But this feast speaks of the church, and there's evil in the church. And he recognizes it. And so in this that typifies and sets before us the church, we find there's evil there is this principle of evil leaven in this sacrifice. Now we are told that when the feast, or the day of Pentecost, was fully come. For a long time I used to think that it meant that it was about 12 o'clock noon. In other words, it didn't happen in the morning, it was fully come, they had to get way up in the day. May I say to you that that's not really the meaning at all. Dr. Vincent in his word studies, gives this meaning, was being fulfilled. In other words, what Dr. Luke is saying here in the book of Acts is that these events that are taking place on this day of Pentecost is fulfilling all the meaning that God had in that feast when he gave it to Israel, and now it's being fulfilled, and from here on out, you won't need to observe the Feast of Pentecost because what it typified and what it pointed to is happening on this day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, was being fulfilled. And these are the things that happened. We are told that they were all together in one place. And Bible scholars have disagreed as to just where that place was. There are two places that evidently could be. It could be in the upper room. It also could be in the temple. And may I say this morning, because we're moving to other considerations, without any offering any proof whatsoever, may I just make the bold assertion that I believe that they were in the temple. I think that that was the proper place. I think that the events of that day fill out only at the temple. I do not think could have been in the upper room. But may I say to you that you may want to accept that position. If you do, you're in mighty good company. But Bible scholars are divided on this particular question. I believe that they were in the temple and I think you'll see why as we move along. Now will you notice, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now somebody says, it says house, but it doesn't say a dwelling where somebody lives. The house can be the house of the Lord, you see. 
Now we are told here, and the important thing to note right here is that suddenly there came a sound. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, there was no warning that he was coming, none whatsoever for the day. There was no countdown. They didn't begin to say 60, 59, 58, 57, one, he's coming, and the button was pushed. It's not the way it happened. He came suddenly. And my beloved, that's the way the church began. May I say to you this morning that that is the way that the church shall end. He says to the church, Behold, I come quickly. And that word quickly doesn't mean he's coming soon. It means when he comes, it'll be sudden. I heard a man say, he said, You know, I got a lot of things to straighten out. And just as soon as I know the Lord's coming, I'm going to straighten them out. Now, I say to you this morning, it won't be time. Behold, I come quickly. And when he begins to move, he'll move suddenly as it was on the day of Pentecost. Now, there's something else here that is very, very important. The Holy Spirit did not come in swaddling clothes in a stable back of a manger. One of the reasons that I believe it was the temple, because this is public that's taking place. All Jerusalem heard the sound of it. And this is very public. We are told here that when he came, there was the sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And this rushing mighty wind, if you please, was like a Texas tornado. I do not know whether you've ever heard a tornado or not. A tornado sounds like a train, a train making a great deal of noise moving through the country. Tremendous sound. And a tornado leaves a path of destruction. Last year when I was in Dallas, they took me along the pathway where that tornado had gone in the spring. And a great deal had been built back, but you could still see the effects and the destruction that had been left. My beloved, here the thing that is important is this. There was the power of the tornado, but there was not the destruction of the tornado. Instead of destruction, there is construction here. There is a sound as of a rushing mighty wind that filled the entire city of Jerusalem. And everyone ran out into the street and said, What is that? And then they began to converge upon the temple area. That's the first thing. And then we are told something else. Will you listen? There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. We are told here these were cloven tongues. And personally, I do not like that translation. It means divided, really. And what it literally means is just simply this, that each person there had a tongue of fire given to him. In other words, there was no preference given to Simon Peter or James and John. The homeless believer in that upper room received the same thing. That's important. It was the same for each one. And it was like as a fire. And the fire speaks to us, of course, of purifying. The purifying ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it also speaks of something else. It speaks of zeal. My beloved, every spirit-filled believer will have a zeal for the things of God. That's one of the things that he will do for every believer. Yet, when he fills a believer, he gives him a zeal for the things of God. And so there was the zeal. 
Now will you notice this, for this is very important to get. There was actually not a wind. There was actually not a fire. Will you listen to the language? As of a rushing mighty wind, but not a wind. Like as of fire. It was like fire, but it was not fire. Why these two? That was, first of all, the appeal to the ear gate. That was the appeal to the eye gate. As we said before, the Holy Spirit did not come in swaddling clothes, born in a manger in Bethlehem that wise men and shepherds could come and look at and worship. He came as the Spirit of God, the third person of the Godhead. And he made the appeal to the ear gate and to the eye gate that men might know that he had arrived. Now we are told here that they began to speak with other tongues. Do you notice that? Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. It was other tongues, but not an unknown tongue. That's very important, by the way. The fact of the matter is, the word for tongue is not in the Greek. The word in the Greek is dialecta. We get our word by transliteration, dialect. They heard every man speaking in his dialect, for there were many Jews yonder in Jerusalem. At that time, we're told, some from Perga, some from Pamphylia, they all spoke the Greek language, but different dialects of the Greek language. And one of my friends who believes in speaking in tongues, I said to him, what accent do you use? A southern accent? The dialect is the important thing, not the tongue. Do you speak with a southern accent or do you speak with a northern accent? Or a western accent? That was the way they heard them speak there. Each man in his own dialect, if you please. Now will you notice the effect that it had? And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilean? In other words, they never could have learned the, our language. How could these people from up in Galilee speak our language when they had never studied it before? And it says here they were amazed. Oh, our language is a beggar for words at times, and we have no word for this word. The Greek word means to be they were out of their senses, and it's translated elsewhere in Scripture that he was beside himself. That means to be out of your senses. You say, so-and-so is not acting naturally. Well, you see, he's beside himself. He's moved over here, and that fellow's not acting right, you see, because he moved out. That's the way the Greeks spoke of it. That fellow is not acting like himself. He's apparently beside himself, and the fellow that's acting up must be somebody else. And these people acted like that. They acted like they were crazy, if you please. And not the people who had received the Holy Spirit. But rather, my beloved, the crowd that had come together, they were the ones that were acting crazy at this time. They were amazed. Now that caused Simon Peter to deliver the first sermon in the church age that began with the day of Pentecost. On that day, 3,000 people were saved. And they were brought into the church, and we were told that they continued in the apostles' doctrine, in prayer and breaking of bread, and in fellowship, and that is, offerings. And that's the message that we have in print, by the way, the spiritual thing, the fingerprints of the visible church today. The church came into being at that particular time, if you please, and up to that time. 
There had been no church, and from that moment on, a church came into existence, my beloved. Now, these are just the bare facts of the day of Pentecost. I want to turn now to the subjective significance of the day of Pentecost. And there are three things we'd like to suggest briefly. First of all, the promise of Christ was fulfilled at Pentecost. That was the fulfillment at Pentecost of the promise that Christ had made. Now we go way back to the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John. You remember on another feast day, the Feast of Lights, the day they poured out the water around the altar. We are told that in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his inmost being shall flow living water. Now, John gives us this explanation, but this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, John is saying the Lord Jesus had to be glorified. Go back to the Father before the Holy Spirit could come and be given to believers. There's the first mention. Then you come to the 14th chapter of John's Gospel, yonder in the upper room. Our Lord said this in John 14, 16, And I will pray the Father, he'll give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. The Holy Spirit had been with them, now the Holy Spirit is to be in them. That is his promise. Again he says in verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And then again, in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter, the Advocate, will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him unto you. And when he's come, he would do certain definite things. And here at the very beginning of the book of Acts, the Lord Jesus made it very clear that they were to stay in Jerusalem, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, you've heard of me. And then he says, Ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. My beloved, these men stood yonder at a chronological crisis in the history of the world, and you and I do not stand there today. They are standing between two dispensations. The dispensation of law came to an end on the cross, the dispensation of grace was beginning on the day of Pentecost, and the church was coming into existence. And the Lord Jesus is saying to these men, You wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit comes. Don't dare advance from this place. My friend, this morning you and I live this side of the day of Pentecost. We don't wait. And if you're going to wait, you'll have to beat it to Jerusalem. That's the only place to wait. We are told today, my beloved, that we are this side of the day of Pentecost. And these men were to wait for power. They needed power. They didn't need methods. They didn't need money. They didn't need more training. They did not need something that was an adjunct to the gospel. They even had the gospel. What they needed was power. 
And then we're told this is what happened. When they were gathered together there on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want to say something here that I want to say kindly, but I want you to follow it very carefully. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues are never associated together in the Scripture. May I say that the speaking in tongues is associated with the filling of the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, not baptized, doesn't say that here. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and it was the filling of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to speak in tongues, not the baptism. And the filling of the Holy Spirit is based on all other ministries, that's true. Every ministry of the Holy Spirit in this age must be fulfilled before a person can be filled by the Holy Spirit. But the, all of the commandments that relate to the Holy Spirit are always connected with filling. In other words, God never asks us to be baptized, never asks anybody to. He never asks anybody to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Never asks you to do that. He does that. He asks you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and He does that. He never asks anyone to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. My beloved, may I say to you that he did say, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. He did say, Grieve not the Holy Spirit. He did say, Quench not the Holy Spirit. He did say, Walk in the Holy Spirit. All of these are in connection with the filling ministry of the Spirit of God. And this morning, what all of us need from the preacher in the pulpit, out yonder to the last person listening today, we all need a filling of God's Holy Spirit. That's the crying need of the hour, for the church is to be filled with the Spirit of God. And to be filled means to have the Spirit of God to come in and fill every area of our life, our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our thinking, our time, all of us, if you please. The little girl prayed. She said, Lord, fill me. I can't whole very much, but I can run over a whole lot. And we need that sort of thing today in the church. We need spirit-filled believers who are running over with the Holy Spirit of God today. Then, my beloved, there is a second significant event. Found the foundational feature of this age is that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to abide. Did you notice that the wind filled the temple, but that the tongues sat upon each one? If you should go back to the dedication of the temple by Solomon, you'd find at that time the glory of the Lord filled the temple. But no one at that time had the tongue of fire coming upon him. That was for each one on the day of Pentecost to let Believers know this, that each believer today doesn't make any difference who he is. If he's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is indwelt by the Spirit of God. What know ye not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Christ was in the world 33 years. He didn't come to abide. He said he came to die. I didn't come here, he said, to stay. I've come to perform my work and I'll leave, but I'll not leave you orphans. I'll come to you, I'll send the Holy Spirit, and he will abide with you forever. And so the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit came to abide in each believer. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is never repeated at Bethlehem. My beloved, may I say this to you, Pentecost will never be repeated. It has never been repeated. Somebody says, yes, but we have a Gentile Pentecost in Acts 10. I disagree with that, my beloved. That's when the gospel went into the home of Cornelius. 
That was not a Gentile Pentecost. On the contrary, it was something else altogether. For you will know that on the day of Pentecost, these Jewish believers had to be baptized before they received the Holy Spirit. And yonder in Samaria, they had to put hands upon them before they received the Holy Spirit. Yonder in the home of Cornelius, will you listen to this, my beloved? They were not baptized. No hands were placed upon them. And Simon Peter didn't even get to the third point in his sermon. While he was yet speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon them to let Gentiles know that in this age the sole and only condition of being saved is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And when men do that, they are indwelt by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God baptizes them into the body of believers. And that thing takes place. Many missionaries have told me that in frontier missions, in the outpost, that they see almost the identical thing that took place in the home of Cornelius. They'll be just speaking. Those that are there that have never heard the gospel before turn to Christ and are saved. Now somebody says, but wasn't the Holy Spirit here before Pentecost? Yes, my beloved, he was here. And Christ was here long before Bethlehem, too. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And we're told that in the days of Noah, the Spirit of Christ was preaching to those back there in the days of Noah. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, we saw him moving the other night in our last study in Second Kings. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. Christ was here before Bethlehem. But at Bethlehem, he became incarnate. He came in a different capacity on a different mission, my beloved. He came to take upon himself our flesh and to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. The Holy Spirit had been here before, but on the day of Pentecost, he came for a definite thing, to call out of this world the church, those who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning you do not have to beg and plead with God to give you the Holy Spirit. The fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit this morning is trying to get a hold of you, trying to get you to yield, trying to get you to turn your life over to God. You don't have to beg Him one moment. He's ready when you are ready today. He's in the world. The third and last thing. The Holy Spirit began on the day of Pentecost the formation of a new body. That new body is the church which Paul identified as the church which is his body. There was no church before Pentecost, I repeat that. There's no church in the Old Testament. John the Baptist never even heard of the church. He never preached the gospel of the grace of God we preach today. Six months before the Lord Jesus went to the cross to die, he mentioned the church for the first time. He says, on this rock I will, future, I will build my church. My friend, this morning there could be no church till Christ died. Because the church is built upon the blood of Christ. Paul says, in whom we have redemption through his blood. He had to come and shed his blood. The church does not look forward to his death. The church looks back to the death of Christ. There could be no church till Christ arose from the dead because the church today has resurrection life. And Paul prayed that the Ephesians might know something of the power of his resurrection. My beloved, today the church could not come in existence till he came back from the dead. There could be no church until he ascended back into heaven. For we are told that he is the head of the body, the church. And Paul wrote to the Colossians and said, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. There could be no church until the day of Pentecost, because the church 
is an habitation of God through the Spirit. And it was not until the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to indwell believers. And this morning, my beloved, he's forming the church. He's calling out of this world men and women who will trust Jesus Christ. He baptizes them, identifies them into the body, the body that's called Christ today. He's calling out a people to his name. And somebody says this morning, yes, I know. He's calling out the good people today. I have something very amazing to say to you this morning. He is not calling out the good people. God is not saving good people. Christ did not die for good people. I've been studying in our noon broadcast. I have to stay ahead, and I'm not very far ahead right now, but I'm in Romans, the fourth chapter. And the other morning, I had one of the greatest thrills of my life. Now, I have known that Romans 4, 5 was in the Bible, but I must confess that the other morning I leaped from my chair when I found out what it really means. Will you listen to this? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. My friend this morning, God is only justifying ungodly people. And do you know why? Because that's the only kind of people he knows anything about. There is not good people from his standpoint. Christ died for whom? The ungodly. He never died for a good man. If you're a good man, you will have to go somewhere else to be saved. You can't come to him. He only died for the ungodly. And those that will believe on him, he justifies the ungodly. Now, he doesn't say he makes them godly. He justifies them. He makes them right before God. He gives them a standing before God. I conclude with this little story. Many of you here this morning heard the late Dr. William R. Newell. To my judgment, the greatest teacher on the epistle to the Romans the world has ever seen. Dr. Newell tells this story that years ago he was conducting noon meetings in one of the downtown theaters in St. Louis. One morning after the service, a man sitting in a box, a middle-aged man, fine-looking man, waited. And as soon as everyone got out, he came to Dr. Newell and he said, Dr. Newell, I'd like to talk with you a moment. Dr. Newell sat down. He said, you are, you're talking to the most ungodly man in St. Louis. And he says, when I say ungodly, I mean ungodly. My name is Captain, and gave his name. I own two steamboats on the Mississippi River. I'm known in this city as an ungodly man. And I want to tell you that I've been trying for the past few weeks to find out if there's any chance for me. And Dr. Newell, in his characteristic manner, says, well, thank God. And the man says, you mean you're thanking God that I'm a bad man? He said, no, I'm thanking God that there's a man who's a sinner who knows he's a sinner. He said, I can talk to you. Well, the man says, what, what can I do? He says, I've asked everybody, what shall I do to be saved? He said, I've gone to preachers, I've gone to my friends. He said, I've prayed, I've read the Bible, I've given away money. And he said, I want you to know that this morning I'm as miserable as I've ever been. 
Dr. Newell said to him, said, uh, did you hear the message this morning I gave, the text? He'd spoken that morning on Romans 4 or 5. The man says, I must apologize. I didn't sleep last night. I've been so distracted, and I didn't hear a word that you said. I'm sorry. But I've been coming here for the past three weeks, every day at noon. I want you to know that I know I'm an ungodly man, but what can I do? Dr. Newell handed his Bible to him, and he said to him, <clears throat> Read Romans 4 or 5. And he read, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The man says, yes, but does that apply to me? He says, what shall I do? And Dr. Newell said, you come and ask me a question I can't answer. You come and ask me what to do, and you've just read where God says, to him that does nothing, to him that worketh not. And this man says, well, my, there must be something for me to do. Dr. Newell said, yes, there's something for you to do, but it's already been done. Christ did it for him. Nineteen hundred years ago, he loved you, an ungodly man. You say you're ungodly, and he did died for the ungodly. He did it for him. He was buried. He was raised the third day. He ascended back into heaven. And he is prepared to justify, make right before God an ungodly man that will trust him. And this man fairly leaped out of his chair. He says, I'll take you on that proposition. I'll take you on that proposition because I'm ungodly. And that man accepted Christ. The next day, when Mr. Newell went into the wings of the theater, there was that man waiting for him. And he said, you know, I'd like to say just a word. And Dr. Newell brought him out and introduced him, and that crowd was really amazed because they, they knew that man and his reputation. He began by saying, he said, You know, I've had a proposition made to me that's been a good one. I, uh, I'm a businessman, and I think I know a good proposition. I had offered to me an ungodly man, and you know I'm an ungodly man, I had offered to me a salvation where God would justify me and make me right because Christ died for me. And I want you to know I've trusted him. It's my Savior. Dr. Newell concludes that story by saying that man lived many years in the city of St. Louis, a credit to the gospel of the grace of God. My friend this morning, he's only justifying the ungodly, and he's taking the ungodly and putting them in the church, that church that will be presented to him someday without spot and blemish. Have you really seen yourself as ungodly. Shall we pray?